Oh, I've, I've been a, a bit despondent because, I mean, I was just listening to some of my recordings, which I haven't uploaded, of which there's probably about nine hours, at least, probably actually closer to ten hours, uh, now that I think about, uh, I'm, I'm stringing the one together, which is essentially almost a nine hour recording, and then there's probably... Uh, two other recordings, which are each about an hour each, all of which I haven't uploaded because I've been a little bit despondent because uh, I really don't like doing justice when I bring up certain tangents and certain elements when I do a very poor showing of that content because I'm often trying to uh, connect to uh, ideas that I've thoroughly explored a long time ago which I don't do justice. I really should keep a notebook, perhaps jot down the essential mechanics of, uh, let's say, certain arguments on certain subject matter or certain positions on certain subject matter, which are, you know, I, they're controversial positions to take. And so when I don't do a good showing of them, it, it makes me feel quite... Uh, uh, callous or, uh, and uh, open uh, or susceptible to uh, a scorn which could be avoided uh, and I don't like sort of creating that almost that moral uh, uh, that's a, certainly a suboptimal way of, of comporting oneself but um, I've been very focused uh, still on trying to integrate metatype and metagram what I am trying to do is actually what I'm trying to do is is not so much the integration it's actually just trying to find a way of justifying the structure of met metagram within some meta type scenario I had always taken uh, now this is perhaps murky because this is memory from over perhaps very close to 30 years ago uh, when I was quite young, that I, I, I have a memory of finding a structural way of seeing why, I see, this is strange, uh, um, because I've, I, I've sort of, I, so I have this very old memory of finding some possibility of how uh, emotional tones might be constructed as a very young child. But I didn't come up with any, I think, set emotional tones, but I had some very strong inklings, which you could basically call them sort of metatype kinds of formulations or, or metatype permeations of how metatype would facilitate the derivation of of uh metagram emotional tones so i have that as a kind of as a bias or a prejudice perhaps even and then i have the actual sort of empirical uh observation of seeing emotional tones by empathizing with people by actually um observing them at work uh, within people as, let's say, motivational, stylistic, uh, uh, sort of like force vectors, and how they interact with other emotional tones that seem to sort of encroach over the same uh, that, that sort of uh, share some of the same sort of uh, sphere of of uh, of interaction and and such so almost a sort of karmic spin in some sense you know sort of as elementary particles that might have uh, like a particular sort of quantum spin um, And it's interesting because well, I don't know if this is a correlation, but within my model of metagram 
uh, emotional tones, there are four separate categories in which there, there are six elements in each category or six spins. So it could be seen that there are Uh, yeah, I see it's this. It, it, anyway, when, when I try to work out what the pattern might be, because you sort of translate that structure of, let's say, four field circuits, each containing six um, Actually, let me. Must be annoying to listen to, but um, yeah, there are only three L. So. There are four field circuits. Each four field circuits is only made up of three. Um, sort of 17 elements uh, sorry uh, is only populated by three distinct cognitive functions but those cognitive functions again can be further subdivided into other groups which pertain to the 17 model and anyway, the, the trying to find some consistent patterns, um, and I haven't I haven't properly tried to investigate this yet. I've I've been instead of looking for technical correlations, I've been trying to first develop an intuition. I, I want to first try to aggregate hypotheses before I look for technical correlations because and I, and I want to sit with trying to develop my intuition and to develop the hypothesis and that requires aggregating and sitting with the broadest perspective the broadest vista uh, that I'm possible of, of sort of aggregating and, and and that that is you know sort of an unpleasant sort of uh, in alchemy it's called negatio perhaps but um so i've in some sense i've, I've been trying to get my distance from it so, so that i could sort of uh, sit with this um anyway uh And in the meantime, I've also, this has somewhat forced me to neaten and, type, and tighten up my understanding of metatype. And I think I've had uh, maybe some breakthroughs with that, which were instigated by having a discussion with someone uh, about their own psychology uh, which sort of uh, forced me to concisely uh, condense, you know, sort of my reading of metatype and to, to give an explanation as to, you know, the potential utility or merits that one could glean from metatype because this person uh, well, let me just say that uh, the working theory is, although I haven't sort of properly typed this person, but I, I'll probably catalog uh, some speculative methodological ways in which uh, I think uh, uh, an individual sort of uh, clinician type person or counselor might um, 
make some inroads into uh, placing uh, and ascertaining sort of the form of metatype uh, of the false ego complex of the person that they are treating. Um, so in... I had sort of encouraged this person, I think, uh, to sort of develop a practice of some kind of self-analysis or some kind of um, self-monitoring and self-evaluation. And... Um, You know, I, I've, I've never worked out the tools uh, to try to diagnose someone's uh, metatype. But in what they were reporting to me, it's, it seemed to me that uh, engaging in a kind of um, interview or a kind of uh, auditing of the other person's mind to hear uh, them work towards arriving at a very clear vision of themselves so that they could have a, a self-awareness um, growing in a kind of self-ownership and in a sort of uh, in a growing awareness of their style of self-determinism and and responsibility that they take for themselves and sort of tracking that very important strain that very important issue that is the kind of core issue that one's character is um, roughly const constellated on the on the grounds thereof um, is that uh, you could essentially ask them uh, you, you could use the tools of power processing and you simply ask uh, I, they're sort of they're, they're sort of slight I'm going to use slightly different wordings but basically you, you could say uh, what conditions have you faced and how have you handled them or you could just say, uh, let me just make sure that I'm, I made a note about this. So let me just find it. Uh, tell me about a condition you have faced. Tell me how you've handled it. Yeah, and instead of the colon there, you could say and. So tell me about a condition you have faced and tell me how you've handled it. Or tell me about a condition you faced and then wait for a response and then tell me how you've handled it. And essentially, if the answers to those questions should perhaps themselves eventuate towards aggregations of issues or at least uncovering recurring motifs and recurring themes but can give perhaps someone the ability to freely um, what's it, to freely cycle between uh, their three sides of the mind to freely cycle between at least their subconscious and um, ego in a very fluid way. But uh, the reason why it gives you that ability, I think, to freely uh, cycle uh, is because essentially you have a certain command, a growing... Uh, 
control over one's own uh, subconscious perspectival framework. And so the... Because uh, you, you, you perhaps have a... I think there are almost... There are representations within the subconscious of all the other three sides of the mind that are primary. The subconscious will have a, have a perspective about its own ability to craft perspectives. It'll have essentially a perspective about itself, about the subconscious. The subconscious will have a subconscious perspective about itself. It will have a perspective about the unconscious and it'll have a perspective about the ego. And that third thing, it having a perspective about the ego, if it's capable of moving between the subconscious perspective of itself or the unconscious, and it's capable of moving between that and the perspective of the ego and back again, it can fluidly and freely um, manage the fluid uh, oper operating of, of each of these three sides of the mind, uh, it can support the fluid, let's say, uh, sort of meta-fluidity, perhaps. Just remember that I link often the subconscious to Keegan stage two. But anyway, I don't need to keep on referring to Keegan's model, but it might give people some parallel uh, correspondent jargon to, to, to track what I'm saying. But this means that you have the ability to use the ego freely and to use the power of the ego to refine and update the internal dynamic with how the subconscious perspectives are integrated uh, between themselves and within themselves. So that the kind of the the sort of trium tribune uh, triumphant uh, the three sets sort of will will also be governed then by a kind of a fourth subconscious perspective that in that th that facilitates the integration of the other three the fluid integration of the other three that that you you end up having confidence in that fourth sort of meta subconscious perspectival framework that supports all three but that is a is a double-edged sword because just as much as you kind of develop that it can be a source of a kind of uh, of a new vector of instability as well if it's not upkept or if it's uh, it, it also becomes an obstacle uh, to some of to some of the other sides of the mind functioning in a way that compromises its uh, the subconscious representation of that integration. So it's sort of self mastery, a claim about self mastery has its own. Uh, bitter consequences or hazards that append to that you've kind of upped the ante to some degree anyway uh, this is a bit of a tangent but um something like it's it's easy to not think of yourself as a liar when, when you never make claims that are hard to upkeep, but if you make the claim that you are in possession of yourself, that you have a kind of self-mastery or self-ownership, then suddenly every time your self-ownership is questioned, then you have to also worry about if you're also a liar or something like that. <laughs> 
so you you sort of you're you're more you're more broadly susceptible. Um. Anyway, uh, you've increased a hazard about having an internal handle between how the sides of the mind interrelate and interconnect, and you've perhaps entered into some kind of tug of war between the sides of the mind that risk the integrity of the entire subconscious because you've upped the ante, is, is what I'm basically talking about. Um, so you need a kind of confident self-knowledge in order to sort of get away with having confidence in a kind of meta subconscious framework or a fourth subconscious integrated framework between the other three frameworks. Um, and then it could just be that your integrated framework has a kind of built in humility module or something like that, or a built in vulnerability module to overcome those kinds of brittle uh, vulnerabilities as it were. But, um, this is rather tangential. Let me get back to my topic. So the point then is, is that um, I was talking so much about uh, being able to freely move between the ego and the subconscious, um, cycling around freely between the sides of the mind. Um, Why was I talking about that? Um, each side of the mind is uh, oh, okay. So I, I guess I'm just trying to give a narrative uh, that are kind of sort of some crib notes, maybe in terms of a therapeutic process. So what facilitates you moving between the sides of the mind is knowing in some sense the content of each side of the mind's child function, dominant function, because then you know the core character, the core impetus of each side of the mind. You know, let's say, their script. You know their, their inclination. You know, let's say, the charge carried by their character, as it were. You know their, their nature, their propensity their proclivity, their basic proclivity. Now, if you know the proclivity of each side of the mind, if you've got your, their, if you know, the, you know, the, the phrase, you've got someone's number, if you've got their number, you don't have to doubt what it is that they're probably up to. You kind of, you, you keep your, you've got your eyes on them. Now there's a, so when you know that, when you know yourself that well, when you have that kind of self-awareness and insight, I don't think your work is anywhere close to being done. I don't think you, that's an, a necessary ingredient towards resolution of certain issues, but it's not the actual work of resolution directly. That gives you the opportunity to monitor yourself in real time, and you might be able to uncover the mechanics of, of self-deception in real time. So that will give you a certain level of protection from, let's say, the unconscious mechanisms, because what I'm basically trying to describe in all of this, that there are sort of, there are two things. There's, there's keeping an eye on your, almost your constitutional nature but then there's also keeping an eye on the mechanistic circuitry that that nature is interfacing with and interconnected between. And that circuitry that between each of the three sides of the mind in particular um, is where a lot of the cognitive dissonance and self-deception take place. And it kind of gets built into premises and conditions. It's built into the edifice or the base of reality so that it is indistinguishable. And so what the parent functions and the inferior functions are doing to each other, 
and between each other as relays is indirectly in service of the child functions and the dominant functions. So knowing the charge of each side of the mind, the charge of the dominant functions and the child functions, is necessary in order to track the mechanistic relaying between each, each of those pockets of charge. Uh, so if you know the content of the charge, then you can witness the relay in real time, and you can have a handle on the relay. You can have... Uh, You can learn the mechanics of how these things are interwoven and, and interdependent and, and relaying things to one another. Because it's, it's the mechanics that need to be properly understood and overcome. Uh, because you can't... Resolving the charge is, is tackling the superego. And when you, before you tackle the superego and try to resolve the issue there and sort of develop a new personality from a, uh, a proper integrated subconscious and superego. So just to say that more slowly, the, the end game is to have a properly integrated superego and subconscious. And that is the hardest thing to do because the subconscious in some sense exists out of the decomposition of the superego. It is the repurposed sin of the superego, an inferior function of the superego, that the subconscious's base and child function are respectively um, constructed out of. And this is uh, essentially why the superego is in a... You, you are not aware of the superego from the perspective of the subconscious. So the subconscious is almost an emergent, secondary uh, effect of the superego. And the superego is, I mean, the, the fundamental crux of the false ego complex, and this is something that I've also, I think, recently discovered, which is worth talking about, because it sheds a lot of light on these issues, is that the and it also sheds, I think, light on the scripture in First John. Uh, I'm worried. I think it's First John chapter five that talks about the sin that is not unto death. But essentially, um, I think the sin that is not unto death is the sin of the subconscious, uh, the sin of the superego, uh, the sin of the unconscious. but not the sin of the ego. I think the, the sin of the ego uh, cannot be a sin that is not unto death. So it is possible to integrate all the other sins to be fed into the ego to process. The, the question is, is, is that some... If, if, if the base of the ego is constructed out of relays that have inherited, let's say, impossible or unsurmountable um, dissonances and contradictions, uh, which are, let's say, a kind of a, a karmic importation from the sin of the other sides of the mind. If if it's not capable, if the ego is not capable of uh, running with those um, imposed limitations and uh, burdening its inferior function, um, Because essentially, the ego, in some way, doesn't have any native sin. It has whatever sin the superego dictates that it has. 
the question is is that can can the ego swallow its own inferior function be integrated with its own inferior function and accept whatever sin is being projected onto it by the superego anyway i've it's a complicated issue and i don't want to focus on that but that under undergirding i mean i think that is the the basic whole i mean it's a very complicated set of of contentious issues and so essentially you have to understand your ego in the proper context before you try to integrate the super ego and the subconscious and the only way to understand the ego is to understand how all the relays throughout all the other sides of the mind amount up into um, being burdened by the ego and so you do have to understand the relay system you do have to understand the mechanics of how the parent functions set up each side of the mind's edifice, platform, base, out of the inferior function of some other side of the mind. And so in, if each side of the mind does not take the requisite amount of responsibility for its local inferior function, it's going to get out of hand uh, when it's used as the base of the next side of the mind going to have a kind of conditionality smuggled in to the base of the next side of the mind and that is going to be something that that side of the mind is not capable of detecting it's not capable of weeding that out it's a failure of another side of the mind it's a an abrogated responsibility it's a shirked responsibility of some preceding side of the mind the only exception is the ego and the superego's relationship because the superego is not capable of um, uh, the, the superego does not relate uh, to the ego's inferior function. Uh, the superego does not use the ego's inferior function as its base. There's a slight asymmetry there. There are things that there are things that I get from Metagram which I still have not fully I'm just thinking about speculations now which I've never sort of tested before, which is that you know, maybe my particular order of where the subconscious and the unconscious and the ego are placed maybe they're placed differently for tamasic individuals or rajasic individuals uh, that's an idea that's worth investigating out Anyway, now is not really the time while I'm making a recording. Um, 
Okay, I was a bit tired when I was uh, making the last recording, uh, so let me get back into uh, the fray and clean up this technical issue, which is uh, a little bit uh, uh, distracting me from the main uh, content that I wanted to talk about, to give a nice sort of narrative overview um, of getting familiar with the mechanics going on. Uh, so let me just try and reframe again why understanding the mechanics is important, not just understanding the charge that each side of the mind holds. Because once one has the number, once one knows the sort of the game that each side of the mind is fundamentally um, contriving to play, then the mechanics become uh, open. But before I do that, I'm going to attend to this issue of what the true end game is and, and somewhat frame why it's important to even accumulate this kind of self-understanding. Um, so essentially what it all comes down to is that there is an asymmetry between the ego and the superego in terms of how they overlap. And what this essentially amounts to is that the ego inherits all the mistakes that each other side of the mind makes in how they interrelate to one another. Um, the ego becomes the, uh, the inheritor of these mistakes. And so almost for no fault of its own, it ends up in sort of erroneous binds, which are somewhat conditioned or are baked into its base of operation. Or also from the other side is magnetically sort of influenced by how its own parent function operates. So the parent function in the ego is going to have a lot of cognitive dissonance is going to have a lot of uh, uh, erroneousness that it's even unaware of and I, I and this is uh, archetypally described as the whore of babylon even i think is is uh, or the city of babylon perhaps even but um in terms of uh although sometimes uh, the city i always relates to the dominant function of the ego and and not the parent function but maybe the ruling caste of the city of the great city of babylon or babylon the great uh, could, could uh, including the whore could be the parent function anyway um now why this matters is because technically other sides of the mind can sin but those can be sins that are not unto death the ego is the only side of the mind where all of its sin will be unto death so the ego cannot sin uh, or should not sin how the ego avoids sin is that it must not expose the parent function to the sin. It must fully absorb the sin vicariously through the inferior function. The inferior function of the ego must develop strong enough to burden on its shoulders the sin. And that is how the ego does not sin, is that it gets absorbed by the inferior function. Now, this is also, the process of this is also um, the process of realizing how um, complicit the parent function of the ego is in the sin. It allows you to see the parent function in a new way, and it allows you to realize how corrupt uh, the parent function is in terms of how much inherited erroneousness has, has gone around. And in some sense, you, you can't just blame everything on the superego. It's not all the superego's fault. It's also the subconscious. It's also the unconscious and how they in turn relay and relate uh, to the ego. So that's why I'm saying that you have to understand the, the, the backstory of the ego 
before you just sort of take the ego to task because otherwise you're going to be doing a continual cleanup job and uh but i mean i don't know perhaps all the tricks uh, of of methodology maybe it is something that can be um that if you focus on maintaining let's say the pristine functioning of the ego that the other aspects perhaps um, take care of themselves as a kind of almost behaviorist therapeutic uh, uh, treatment um, but maybe it also helps uh, what I've just described to know the process of what's happening that that essentially the the inferior function is learning more about the backstory of the seeing its parent function in a new light and so the inferior function grows to integrate and to uh, align all the three sides of the minds the unconscious the subconscious and the ego with the inferior function therefore stealing let's say the the powers away from the um sort of the mechanic the uh, the mechanics that amount to the collusion uh, of support that the parent function is enjoying um so that in that way you end up stealing power away and dissolving uh the material that you know the blood of the saints which feeds the the the, the whore of babylon you end up reclaiming the blood of the saints which make up the 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 mortar of of uh, Babylon the Great. Um, so, uh, okay. So there, there are other things that, that are going on here. So again, I've said the most important thing is the integration between the super ego and the subconscious, but. So, I mean, like, self, proper self-actualization and, and having a solid new personality is the integration between uh, the superego and the subconscious and the, the special role that the ego plays. And so I'm, what I've just been talking about is the special role that the ego plays. Um, so the superego, in its ideal form, becomes how the ego experiences the world the problem is is that ordinarily the parent function is colluding with the world is a part of the world the the parent function and the ego is helping the world is is uh, um is on the side of the world and the inferior function is capable of of becoming an independent node that ta that takes on the burden that the super ego places on the ego and therefore it can grow in its consciousness it can grow in its awareness and it can integrate things and learn things about the iniquity of the parent function um And the point of this is that the parent function needs to be purified. It doesn't need to be destroyed, or it, in some sense it needs to be rebuilt. And this is problematic, because I don't think that this is possible unless you understand the mechanics that lead up to it. Because the parent function, the ego, is going to inherit a proclivity towards its iniquities and its collusion with the world. If you don't understand that those things are properties that are coming from the subconscious and the unconscious and the superego and how the superego relates to the subconscious and the unconscious but the subconscious i think is more the root of the new personality and the mother of the new personality that if you have the the, the subconscious properly integrated with the superego then you are avoiding 
the ego's, uh, uh, let's say, continual predicament of landing itself in hot water and, and that the inferior function is continually having to... Um, so, so essentially, the inferior function is being crucified as the scapegoat of the ego. But what it also needs to do is that it needs to crucify the fleshly thinking, which is contained in the parent function of the ego. So the, the, the flesh is not the body. The flesh is the content, the erroneous content, the impure content of the parent function, which is colluding with, with the superego, essentially. And you need to get the parent function on the side of the inferior function, but that means that the inferior function in the ego has to grow in responsibility and accountability and integration. It has to become a proper node of accountable control and integration between the other sides of the mind. But in some sense, some of those sides are too far away. The subconscious is rather far away. So the subconscious has to have, in some way, a sympathetic system, perspective, framework, that mirrors the, the functioning of that inferior function, uh, um, the proper functioning of that inferior function. So the true, the new Jerusalem is being built in the, in, um, in the subconscious. Um, which can also, uh, this gets more and more confusing, which can also be said to, like, be spiritually modeled as existing within the superego. So the, the let's say, the original New Jerusalem is, is perhaps directly within the superego as an, as an a priori ideal. And that is the schematic for it being incarnated within the subconscious as the new personality. And that is how these sides of the mind sort of sing together. That, uh, and, you know, I think that there is a lot of, uh, the superego can also be seen as where Eden once was. But the description of the New Jerusalem in um, in Revelations is that uh, the New Jerusalem is, is, is a city uh, that has the tree of life in, uh, inside the city. Um, and so... Or maybe this is how it's divvied up. If the tree of life is in the super ego, and the city is is the subconscious. Um, anyway, and uh, somewhat the complexity of that city that has, you know, sort of transparent glass streets, and it has um, 12 gates, and it has trees that have, you know, 12 kinds of fruits that are thousands in their fruitfulness is, uh, is how the subconscious, I think, relates to the unconscious. You know, this kingdom of God is within you. It's it's a psychological schema. It's not a um, it's not an outward uh, manifestation. Um, it's only visible to those with a spiritual 
discerning. Um, anyway, uh, so the the real crux uh, and the, the the points of tension is that you have to get each of your parent functions in line because they are involved in certain mechanics that have cognitive dissonances, they have sort of self-deception baked in to the process. And so even if you have an eye on the charge being held by each side of the mind, by each child function and dominant function, those child functions are being catered to by parent functions that have created the, the conditioning the, the, the edifice and the platform that has conditionality baked into it in order to support a child function. And it, in order to support a certain kind of charge. And these mechanics are in a relay and eventually the ego inherits this and then the parent function uh, of the ego could be seen as the master node of mechanics and it was the first it is the strongest ontologically uh well man when i say that it, it was the first that occurred uh after the the world became visible around it which was essentially the the super ego so it was it was the first to develop because the super ego sort of, I don't even know how to describe that. The super ego is almost like an a priori. Um, uh, paradigm. And the ego parent function grew out of that and it was alone. And the first thing it did was set up the subconscious and then the subconscious and the ego together worked out how to sort of stabilize themselves independently of the superego and engage together in the unconscious. And so we've always had this independent being outside of the superego, but the superego is still this kind of uh, procedural conduit through which experience is fundamentally um, perceived. Uh, it is the, the particular part of the mind that is the lens through which we connect to others. It is the... Um, And I, it is the display screen of the outside. So if the, the consciousness is this pristine, internal, contemplative, you know, hologram that also has the hardware of its own, um, all, uh, all of it is inside of itself, part of itself is given over to make a, a display that connects or that, that, that perceives, that doesn't, um, and the iniquity that we have is, uh, is that the ego is the first recipient, is the first viewer of that display, and what the ego has done is that, and also how it has related to the other sides of the mind, is it has worked out a way to vicariously uh, view itself through the conduit of the superego. So it's sort of, it's modeled itself into the viewing. Uh, 
and only the inferior function of the ego has the independence and let's say the analytical uh, resources to witness the um, let's say the almost circular reasoning and the the sort of the self deceiving sort of confabulation of that, but essentially that the worst thing is is that this means that the sin of the ego is right on the monitor is 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 an element of the viewing of the super ego is, is being transmitted and so if the ego doesn't find a way to not sin it has a constant stream of feedback which it is implicitly um prone to um, reflecting onto its own camouflage because of its idea that it's in, that it is incepted within its own viewing of of uh, of the super ego so it really has to keep itself as being distinctly apart from the world in order that the super ego does not have this immediate repudiation of the ego so the ego is is sort of a glutton for punishment because uh, the parent function is engaging in a kind of self-denigration uh, but it's a kind of it's a mechanical one that is also sometimes not not the ego's fault because the parent function is uh, um, downstream of the other parent functions in the other sides of the mind. And I slightly misspoke in what I just said in that the superego parent function can also be the problem. But the only thing that can uh, The only thing that can resolve that problem is really the subconscious and the ego's inferior function in conjunction with each other somehow. But the inferior function of the ego doesn't really have any mechanism of, of uh, resolving the issue. They, it just really has to stoically put up with it. But it's the subconscious parent function that has to sort of along with the other parent functions, um, predominantly the unconscious parent function, and So I, I, yeah, I would say that the subconscious parent function really has to create a model for a new personality and a different mode of relating to the superego. And maybe the ego is the last to fully fall into alignment with this new structure. And this new structure has to develop in a kind of bifurcated project between the inferior function and the subconscious parent function. Um, somewhat facilitating the divorce of the superego and the ego's parent. And so you, you're having a kind of a priori cleanup within how the superego is being viewed. I mean, this can be, you know, because what am I really talking about? Because all of these things, the, the subconscious is a reservoir of belief and, and beliefs and sets of beliefs will always have, uh, within those frameworks will result in a certain uh, 
set of possible propositional contemplative thinking. So the subconscious is the keystone of the ego's contemplative uh, uh, range of possibility and range of contemplative thinking. And so on some level, all of this is, is a subconscious development, because if you don't change your beliefs, if you don't alter your, your framework, your perspectival framework, if you don't have enough of, let's say, a philosophical interface that's fluid, that allows what's going on in the ego to be lockstep and uh, connected with the subconscious, then the altering of the subconscious is not going to um, facilitate, let's say, the rebirth of the ego. Anyway, I've uh, talked about... Uh, okay, so all of this is, is very, very complicated, and it's, it's more complicated because all of these things can be described in many, many different ways. Um, because you can describe it in terms of one side of the mind and how the one side of the mind is going to sort of uh, feel the changes in the other sides of the mind. Um, Anyway, um, okay, so the, the technical issue of um, how these relays sort of work. So, again, the important thing to understand is that there is a basic asymmetry between the ego and the superego. But um, because of this asymmetry, there are two distinct circuits. The two distinct circuits are that the superego is connected to the unconscious and the unconscious is connected to the superego. That is a circuit that is a circular circuit. So the one flows to the one and the other flows back. Um, so that's a circular circuit with, with, two, with uh, two parent functions. So... Um, And those two parent functions are using two different inferior functions to connect uh, on, on either side of themselves. So the parent function of the superego is using the subconscious inferior function as a bridge to connect with the unconscious parent function. So in this circuit, uh, on one side of the circular circuit, uh, the bridge of the subconscious inferior function is um, got a, a bit of circuit which is longer, which is how the superego is reaching towards the unconscious and connecting to the subconscious inferior function and then the unconscious parent function is leading that inferior function which it's which that unconscious inferior function sorry that unconscious is using that subconscious inferior function 
is, is repurposing that inferior function and using it as the base of its side of the mind. That is the platform that the whole unconscious side of the mind is, is uh, uh, constructed out of, is built out of an inferior function of the subconscious that has been primed, that has been injected with the superego's parent function modeling itself in that subconscious inferior function because the subconscious doesn't like its own inferior function so it's allowed it to be occupied by the superego and the superego has created a mini node of itself a mini clone of itself and then that clone has been manipulated like a puppet by the unconscious parent function being the puppet is essentially a reference of self because you have to remember yourself in order to have a false ego complex you have to have an image of yourself and that image is is produced out of the super ego's parent function and it is modeled within the inferior function now this um these models, these self-references, are how we get confused when these things aren't uh, in alignment with each other, when they don't resonate with each other. And in some sense, they can never fit perfectly because they are sketches. They are not, um, they are not living, they are dead. They are, I also link them to the beast and, and literally to the death. Um, and parent functions in the, um, in the Christian scripture, I believe, they are what is described by James as the enticed lust. And so... And the inferior function is the trial. And so it is the trial of one side of the mind that is judging its own vanity, is judging its own sense of how it was being drawn away by the lust. Well, if you're going to be drawn away by the lust and then enticed, That, that the local parent function, the subconscious's parent function, has to sort of check up after it's enticed itself to continue, after it's been drawn away. Um, because to be drawn away from the lust is to broaden the lust and go off and do something else. The vanity is, is a very interesting thing because the vanity is a kind of indulgence into something that is broader, that is beyond the lust. So I actually believe that the vanity, I call it the vanity, but in in James, he, he says that you're being drawn away by the lust. Vanity is a potential kind of independent charge that you have a broader knowledge than what is required just to facilitate the lust. But you do this because the lust is, is fundamentally hollow. So it has to be broadened. The scope of knowledge has to be broadened even to ostensibly fulfill the lust, even to do something about the lust. But once you have a broadened perspective, you have to be enticed in order just to continue to do the lust. And that enticement is... Um, is what the parent function is. It's a kind of, it's a sense of agency. It's it's almost a kind of hubris to some degree, and the uh, the, the problem is already that the enticement is giving itself the in, the job to reinvent the child function or to broaden the aspect of the motivation. So the enticement is already sort of acting on the same level, on the same plane as the child function, as the lust. It's giving itself the scope to modify the lust. 
and in some sense the, the next function is even a meta judgment on that well then you are prone to well how how did you broaden the child function what metric did you use what analysis and so the inferior function sits in judgment of the enticement the the nature of the enticements and the uh, the conviction or something like that and the inferior function is just i mean i conceive of it as a as a blank open check which in its blank open checkness has no um is going to produce an indictment because it has every resource it has every awareness uh, available to it um, to imagine something that's even ulterior to the whole system because in some sense the inferior function is is even beyond the, the false ego complex it's outside of the false ego complex and so the only way to have judgment or the trial which is on some sense fundamentally has to has to judge the child function has to judge the lust as not being fulfilled it has to sort of gain the awareness that the child function is not being served is not going to be affected that the will the motivation Im, uh, implied by the child function is not going to be executed so the charge that the inferior function amounts uh, to uh, issuing is the charge of non-execution of one's own will. It's just a mirror. It's a mirror to reflect the fallen character and the fallen nature, which becomes an obvious. It becomes the, the next. The, the the natural next link in the chain after the enticement because the in, if you can entice yourself towards the lust that means that there is something about yourself that is not robotic and the inferior function is the the true more full manifestation that you have the capability to be beyond this program this structure this architecture and so essentially the thing that is utilizing the inferior function are these foreign parent functions and the two neighboring parent functions to this side of the mind uh, that are essentially using the inferior function to judge the local parent function to judge the local enticement are the other enticements and so each inferior function becomes a reflection of foreign neighboring enticed lusts foreign neighboring parent functions but if these foreign neighboring parent functions have to collude in their judgment or their trial of their of a local parent function of a local enticement this is the negotiation that is integration between the sides of the mind this is the negotiation that is the cohesion and and self-consistency to having a constellated or at least a, some kind of internally sequenced procession or mode or orientation Anyway, I'm just lumping adjectives together, but um, <clears throat> but there there is a structural limitation here. The structural limitation being is that each inferior function is only going to so each the, there are four inferior functions in my model of the false ego complex, and therefore each inferior function the inferior function in the subconscious is a is being primed by the super ego's parent function and is being um, led uh, by the unconscious parent function and 
the ego's um, inferior function is being primed by um, the unconscious parent function and is not being led um, by the superego. That's the asymmetry, which actually just brings me into the realization that I mis misspoke earlier when I said that the superego and the unconscious is a circular um, is is a circular uh, uh, circuit. It's not a circular circuit. It's the subconscious and the ego is a circular circuit, in which the ego is connected to the sub uh, subconscious and the subconscious is connected to the ego on both sides. Whereas the superego and the unconscious are only connected through one bridge. And then on the other side, there is an asymmetry. There's a break in the symmetry. So I must apologize that I misspoke. That is somewhat, it might require re-listening to it with that mistake that I made in mind. But perhaps I've more um, explicitly uh, illuminated why uh, there is this uniqueness of the ego because of this asymmetry between the ego and the superego. Um, and so because the ego and the subconscious really do have a circular connection and you'll excuse me if I don't, um, I, I will provide a, a, a diagram. Um, where then perhaps it would have been obvious as I was talking the mistake that I made about the circularity of uh, the superego and the unconscious. Um, but then it will be obvious that the ego and the uh, subconscious are circular uh, in terms of how they, they are connected. But anyway, uh, the point being is that each of these each of the four inferior functions are unique, therefore, and then there's a sort of a second level of uniqueness because of uh, the asymmetry in the one circuit, because I, they're still two distinct circuits, the one circuit including the superego and the unconscious, and the other circuit including the ego and the subconscious. Now, those two separate circuits are it's perhaps even slightly misleading to call them separate circuits but it's, it's just to say that their mechanics of their parent functions and inferior functions have have bespoke roles they have this is what gives i think the the the, the characteristic of each side of the mind has its own somewhat unique characteristic and and role in things. I know that in the first recording, I haphazardly speculated that maybe people that have different gunas have a differently ordered sides of the mind. Um, I think that that was perhaps an irresponsible. I mean, it might be that they use their sides of the mind or that their sides of the mind have a, uh, have a different kind of internal orientation in some way have a um, I mean the, the best way I mean I know for a fact well I, if, if I am correct uh, in my metagram modeling which I don't like I'm I've only been talking about metatype but essentially the reason that I've been so hard on myself um, is because I've been trying to just tie everything together within my psychological models and I'm having trouble trying to justify m what I call metagram emotional tones but what metagram emotional tones are is that when these inferior functions are judging a local side of the mind the inferior function is containing in some way a 
emotional tone that has been negotiated by the parent functions, by those foreign neighboring parent functions. So somehow there is a um, ideal self or there is an, a sentiment or attitude, there is a self-image that I have condensed into the idea of an emotional tone which is really, they're not really emotional, they're more, I've, a better, a more correct word would be a cognitive inflection. So it's a, and they come in, in two different varieties, but essentially it's two cognitive functions. It's a style of, of how one cognitive function is either leading or displacing the use of another cognitive function. And this creates a tool of policing that local side of the mind from not disturbing the interests of the other sides of the mind, of the neighboring sides of the mind. This, this says you must respect this image of yourself. So it's like a totem. It's like, uh, I think that this, this may be in some convoluted uh, spiritual sense that this amounts to a kind of idolatry. But it's an idolatry not about, uh, about confining the image of yourself, uh, the, the image of your soul. So you're typecasting your own soul and applying it as the standard of judgment in, in the trial within your own local side of the mind to hold the characteristic or the, or the characterology. Or the, uh, the, I'm trying to invent a word, but characterological bound you're trying to bound the characterological distinctness of your of your side of the mind so that you can um have some kind of internal uh, mediated um, collaboration or coordination, but it's a tug of war in position. So this is there as the gatekeeper to the local parent function to go no further so as to not upset the conditionality that is needed for the proceeding side of the mind to use its in inferior function as a platform, as an edifice, because you need rules, you need limits as the as the basic container to operate a new sphere of operation to operate a new level of operating but it usually takes on a, a so i mean you can see that the subconscious is a perspective framework of belief the unconscious is the realm of activity or action or subjective uh, uh, engagement and participation uh, the unconscious is a participatory domain uh, and the reason why it's participatory is because you don't know the outcome. So you are unconscious of the result, but it's kind of like you're enacting it. So it's the side of the mind that facilitates um, engaged participation. So you are, in a sense, the field of action is the unconscious. And then the ego is the kind of moral judgment and literally the voice in your head or the the container of contemplative judgment is the ego and then the super ego is 
the a priori perspectival lens of the let's say the metaphysical environment the uh, um the procedural constraints the sort of the source code of uh the matrix the the m machines but and the gremlins underneath you know sort of the four corners or, or something like that and in some sense the super ego is doesn't make sense in terms of the ego but it makes perfect sense in terms of the subconscious because to have a perspectival framework the, the subconscious is like the posterior uh, schema that needs to be founded on an a priori metaphysic. But uh, anyway, so, so these are... But they have these, these relays with each other. So they're sort of they're all these tugs of wars all over the place. And you have to understand exactly what they're doing in those tugs of war. And you have to maybe ameliorate. And you have to sort of make... Don't try to maximize. Try to maximize the side of the mind that is not represented. That would be perhaps how to integrate and overcome in a vast way. Is that you when the inferior functions need to be integrated with the parent function that is not being judged and the parent function that is not negotiating the self-image, that the missing parent function, if it was combined then, would perhaps unlock you from the emotional tone, from the, the standard, would... So the inferior function contains the key to uh to the elaborated self-actualized fluid and organic let's say feng shui of being able to use all emotional tones uh, because you know emotional tones are also complex things that i don't want to talk about too much um but they they are like colors uh they have their own sort of way of, of mixing or whatever. And in some sense, they, I think, emerge procedurally from the character of the superego because we can only interpret what we see as these emotional tones. And you have to infer from that, you have to infer the ego behind it. The character of the ego, but you can only see the emotional tone. So this is why spiritual discerning is necessary. And only a, a well-developed ego or a, a, an actual mature developed to have a, a, a developed ego, you have to have a properly structured subconscious. And only with these things in common or uh, in alignment or, or resonating, but also in can only with the communion of those things, which are a subjective thing, um, do we have a shared spiritual reality beyond the emotional tones? Um, beyond the karmic hologram, as it were. And so I do believe that essentially the, the height of what the Christian doctrine is talking about is how to transcend karma as a, um, as a culture of spiritual communication. Um, anyway, I'm talking about a lot of things now. Maybe I should, I should just stop the recording. Um, but yeah, um, I think I've kind of covered things. But uh, oh man, I, no, I should talk about. So, one of the first ingredients is that you have to know the charge of each side of the mind. But another thing is you have to understand this thing about the parent functions. Because you have to modify your judgment in such a way that it facilitates resolution and integration. And that does require some kind of inductive process. 
uh, that I have somewhat given the narrative and the outline for. Perhaps I haven't given a perfect step-by-step, -step, you know, sort of thing, and it, it, it isn't a an exactly a procedural science. It's more of an art, but you have to kind of have the right thing in mind, but I, at least I've given large components, I think, of, of it. Um, but yeah, it would perhaps have to be reordered uh, into a more presentable and digestible um, form. Okay, an, an important addendum uh, is to perhaps go get into the minutia of uh, two problems that need to sort of be understood simultaneously in order to make ground uh, on, on either of those fronts, which is the the fact that, you know, uh, as it's said in scripture, the whole world lieth in wickedness and sin. And this is produced just by the superego's correct perception of the world, as it were. And this needs to be understood, and this needs to be burdened by the inferior function that confronts such a world. Uh, and that doesn't allow the parent function of the ego to be a part of that world and so cleanses and crucifies the fleshly thinking in the parent function um, so that it, the inferior function can continue to die daily can continue the process of uh, dying to the sin of the world of, of performing that burden, that spiritual work. And this can be uh, um, also dealt with from the level of the subconscious, not, let's say, avoided, but this can be, the subconscious can help the ego manage this work and this burden, as it were. Um, by having an awareness of the internal mechanics, the subconscious having a framework that allows it to understand the, the world or the super or, 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 or the super ego. And that understanding is equivalent to the tree of life, having access to the tree of life. Um, because avoiding this challenge would be a kind of perfection that would itself be a kind of dead or abstract way of correlating to life, um, or in a dead way of correlating to one's own psychology. Um, it would be an inert, sort of abstract, hypothetical mass. Anyway, um, this really is a reflection also of the of the toxic mechanic, which is exemplified by how the ego toxically relates to the superego, which is that essentially when the ego's parent function is part of the world or is colluding with the world, the, the ego, which is the percipient of the superego, primarily through the inferior function of the ego, that should be burdening um, the base of the superego, which is also the sin of the ego. So, so the edifice or the platform or the death of the superego uh, sometimes I've referred to this as the terminal beast is the sin of the ego. And the inferior function has to um, has to uh, uh, 
make sure that uh, the woman, the the parent function of the ego, does not worship the beast, that beast. That's that's the role of uh, uh, crucifying the fleshly thinking. That's all the inferior function has to do. But to put it in another way, how this is happening is that the percipient of the superego, the percipient of the world, has to not see a part of that world as a mirror reflecting the ego. The ego cannot collude with the world. The ego must be distinct and separate from the world, it must be a part of from it, not a part of it. And so, and, and the, re, the reason why this is, is because if a part of the perception of the world is a mirror that is reflecting collusion coming from the ego, That is essentially because the parent function and the ego has to is is constructing the world as being a, a mirror or a partly a mirror uh, that includes itself because the parent function of the ego has this voracious appetite. The whore of Babylon wants to see itself in its own uh, uh, in, in the delusion or the illusion of its own uh, centralized control and command of, of it all. The problem is, is that this simultaneously is an instant or a preemptive feedback. So the minute that you say that the world is reflecting the condition of your ego, it is simultaneously um, showing your ego uh, in a kind of circular, it's almost like a, like a coding error that you've created sort of uh, uh, an infinite circular process that is insoluble uh, and which sort of very quickly fills up all the all the memory banks with uh, a, a useless process that can never have a resolution um, because uh, if part of the world is a mirror that reflects uh, the ego's parent function um, and the ego's parent function has to invent that mirror, has to actually uh, construct that mirror as a projection, you have a sort of a circular regression. Um, in which you have a whole hypothetical alternative um, And a plethora of these hypothetical alternative uh, uh, versions of reality um, in which you can't tell if there is a plethora of worlds or a plethora of hypothetical egos. And you don't know which sort of um, correlate is prime except to sort of tell yourself correctly that you you never should have done that, that that whole setting up two mirrors opposite each other and then asking yourself which reflection of the mirror is prime is 
a question that is itself a uh, an impossible sort of self-denigrating um, confusion in itself. And so the kind of the, that question is, I think, very much in line with what the question is in my diagram, which I call um, the unconscious priming of the ego's inferior function. And that is really what I think is actually your stream of consciousness. When you, the actual voice in your head, the contemplative narrator that is contending and ordering the thoughts in your mind, this is the question, is built from that. And you have to sort of unincept yourself from the error of looking at the world as a mirror of the ego's parent function. And so extracting the ego's parent function from the superego sin, distinguishing the boundaries of these things and separating them is... Um, the inferior function of the ego must be an intercessor of holding these things as being distinct. Um, and in so doing, will monitor the propensity of the parent function in the ego for its iniquity, for its erroneous attachment to wishing to view itself in the world which is really the nature of the, or the prima materia out of which the false ego relays and self-image gets congealed into a kind of fixed roles of, or a fixed script of idolatry performances of, or at least uh, castings of one's self as a, as a attitude of, or a standard that holds the um, the rigid pattern of uh, um, holding each side of the mind in its own sort of sustainable level of cognitive dissonance requisite to keep the the circus going or uh, something like that but um i mean the problem is is that i mean people know that the false ego complex doesn't work out and in some sense it's all burdened by the question it's all burdened by the contemplative stream of thought but it's not the contemplative stream of thought is not capable of solving that mystery it's only capable of doing the work that provides the ingredient that allows the subconscious to resolve the mystery uh, which is something like a kind of behaviorism but a kind of one that's based on some kind of philosophical confidence in a posterior schema um, that brings the a priori framework into a um, so you know this is sort of I'm dealing somewhat with the abstract problem of you know how do you rehabilitate uh, the greater of the greater segment of the divided line how do you rehabilitate ideal forms they're supposed to be ideal and the answer is, is that, well, they were never tarnished. The thing is, is that the, uh, the ego and the subconscious were the things that were sympathetically projecting bad things onto them. And in some sense, uh, you were being confused by the cherubim that keeps the way of the tree of life, the sword that turns every way, the inferior function of the superego is that uh, cherubim and the uh, 
and the uh, the tree of life is in some sense the rehabilitated parent function of the super ego um, but it's rehabilitated relative to the cleaning up of the problems in the subconscious and the ego which does require let's say a spiritual understanding um, which is effectively developed by the subconscious and the ego. Which is naturally the strongest structure in, in one psychology, or at least for not someone that is um, extremely, you know, sort of... Uh, disfigured by some kind of uh, extreme uh, psychopathology but I think that anyway, I, I think that's a good sort of overarching uh, view of these kinds of matters. Um, And by the way, the, the reason why the superego's inferior function is the sword that turns every way, while also it is actually, it does, according to my model, hold a particular emotional tone. What makes it the sword that turns every way is because of the asymmetry between the ego and the superego. Um, in that the unconscious does not connect to the superego. Via the ego's inferior function. Therefore, the meaning, the, meaning that the relay that connects the superego to the unconscious um, No, 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 no. Uh, I said completely the wrong thing. The inferior function in the superego, which is the relay between the subconscious and the ego, although it can be negotiated between the ego and the subconscious's parent function, its meaning in the context within the superego is completely unconnected to the unconscious. So the unconscious does not get a second bite at the cherry. Or it has absolutely no way of knowing because the 
so the the super ego is a one way expression uh, and you don't know what it means internally you, you don't know what the inferior function is doing to the super ego you, you don't know what its own inferior function is doing to itself um, because the unconscious parent function is out of that loop so you can only see things coming out of the super ego you don't know you, you don't have any feedback about how it's but how it's uh, uh, what is it it's it means in terms of itself in some sense the only way that the base of the super ego is constructed is from the character of the ego the action of the ego as it were uh, the operation or activity of the ego um, and its internal constitution is what amounts to the the base of the super ego And so it really is if that the if the ego can stop sinning or contributing to the sin of the world then the world can become to steal Descartes phrase a clear and distinct perception that it can interface with that the ego can then properly use to track its environment without this kind of sort of spiraling uh, uh, regressive feedback loop uh, uh, um, of, of hypothetical ways in which one can reconstruct a mirror that is projected as part of the world that reflects the ego in the world uh, that gives the parent function its ability to sort of to alter and hack and uh, try to conveniently um, use the world as a puppet while it while that also tries to use uh, which that comes with the invariable cost of making itself into a puppet and you know it, it's a self-defeat this is why the whore of babylon is is not called the queen of babylon because she has no integrity she is ultimately a whore and so she de facto rules but she doesn't she doesn't get a title she can't have the name she loses the name because it's almost like a hydra um anyway the, that relates to the recording uh near the end of my eight hour recording um which you know uh, anyway but yeah, I think that this is basically the resolution of all this stuff. Uh, I mean, the problem is just that it's so complicated. But I think it does very clearly describe all of all of psychology. I think it does clearly describe all of the components of thinking in the parts of the mind. And it, you know, the problem is is just that it's so bloody complicated. Um, but then did people think consciousness, you know, uh, would be simple? And by the way, th this is why what I call the stimulus, which in the diagram is the devotion. Uh, Uh... 
the devotion and the declaration. The reason why it's called the stimulus is because it relates the ma maybe I shouldn't have even brought this up, but you know, in this other jargon. But um is because I always knew that the stimulus was something like the impetus of this might be confusing, the, the impetus of sort of chaos into the system, which is seen in some sense because which is seen to be affected by uh, um, caused by the superego that it is impelled by the superego into the system and the reason why I call it chaos is because you don't know the source of it because it's like the sword that turns every way it is that it's, it's the house of that cherubim that's the sword that turns every way anyway um the sword being the archetypal description of the tongue which is the another sort of archetype related to the word and understanding because it is the understanding it is the tongue that issues forth the the weapon of the spirit the the cutting and the uh, the thing that can uh, cut you to life or cut you to death or cut down the understanding and and cut down the spirit and uh, uh, and a sword that turns every way is uh, the word that cannot be understood but I do think that essentially if you know if you have a full model and understanding of the terrain that can be accessed through the subconscious but it is not access directly because essentially you build the new Jerusalem the subconscious around the tree of life um, because you know where it is I mean the, the description of the tree of life in the new Jerusalem is that it's uh, beyond a creek I think or it's beyond a, a river uh, within the city um, to something else as well but it was sort of within the bounds of the city okay well anyway I, I think this has been useful because I think that this resolves a lot of the issues so